Shopify Masters listeners, Felix here. We've got a special episode today. We are catching up with three merchants who've previously been on the show. They share updates on their business and how they are adapting to the impacts of the current COVID-19 outbreak. We are chatting with Catherine Gaskin from The Content Planner on bringing workshops online, Jimmy Finley Hickey from Finley Hats on leveraging various capital lending programs, and Patrick Cadu from Supply on how they turn around their business from a drop in sales. Before we dig into our show, I wanted to let you know that the team at Shopify recently put together the Reunite, a free live stream where the company's leadership team share new and upcoming e-commerce products and provide insights about the future of commerce. You can watch quick recaps of key announcements plus find resources on how to put new tools into action for your business by visiting shopify.com slash stream. First up, we are checking in with Catherine Gaskin from The Content Planner. The Content Planner is the first and only physical planner for your blog and social media content. You'll learn how she had the biggest revenue month in her entire year, even in the light of the pandemic. So Kat, can you describe your business and what you were selling before the pandemic happened? Yes, my business is called The Content Planner, and it is a physical product. It is the first and only physical planner. So it's a paper, book, journal, agenda, whatever. It's not a digital spreadsheet, and it's dedicated just for planning your online content. So I sell that through Shopify and e-commerce. And before the pandemic happened, I, of course, was still selling my physical products, but I was also offering in-person workshops for all of my customers and my online community where they would learn in person over the course of one day how to plan their content and how to maximize the content planner as well as how they're showing up online. And those were my two biggest offers. And I was just getting ready to launch the in-person workshops and and take them across North America before uh, March 2020. So this was something that you were already, I guess, what was the breakdown of how much of your business was in these in-person workshops versus the uh, the planners that you were selling? Yeah. So to give you an idea of percentages and revenue with the content planner right now, it retails for $59.99 US dollars. And to attend the in-person workshop, so you could either do a retreat, which was more of accommodations like Private Chef, and it was a very intensive experience of the brand. So that was a high ticket offer. It was priced between $1,400 to $1,600 US. And then to attend the standalone workshop, which was one day, that was between $400 to $800 US. So as you can see, compared to a $60 planner, it was a huge revenue generating product for me that I could now offer in person. So the workshops for me were huge. Got it. So now once you once things kind of started escalating pretty quickly with the pandemic hitting North America, the lockdown happening, obviously, uh, now has an impact on your business but at the time, like what was your immediate reaction? Yes, it was really fast. I saw things coming every day. There were new developments and changes and new policies and rules. And I had to act really quickly because one of my workshops was in Calgary uh, on March 28th and 29th. So around the beginning of March, I was like, okay, let's see how it's going to go. Maybe we can still go, but we'll have to postpone the future workshops, which were scheduled for Vancouver, Toronto, Miami, and New York for the rest of 2020. And so for me, it was within a 48 hour period. Like it was really fast. And I think as entrepreneurs, the pivot is not really anything new to us because every day we're were dealt different challenges and obstacles. So I would, I would obviously like to say I was stressed and I was anxious and I was kind of scrambling, but there was another side of me that felt very equipped for the oncoming change and kind of everything turning upside down because as an entrepreneur, you're so used to that feeling already. And so within a matter of two days, so I initially posted about the workshop on my Instagram. And I said, Hey, everyone, what would you think about taking the in-person workshops that I've been doing and transferring them online? Here's how long it would be. Here's where you could access it. What do you think? And I actually put it into an Instagram poll. And I said, if I get more than a hundred votes for yes, then I'll do it. 
because with me, with my community, I'm so mindful of asking them for feedback, asking them questions, really listening to them and figuring out, okay, if I know this is what they want, if, if this is what I know their problem is, my job as a business owner is to simply create some sort of product or offer or solution to their problems. And so I received over a hundred votes on that story within 24 hours. From that time, within a 48 hour period, I launched the sales page. I taught myself Zoom. So I've never done a virtual workshop. I've never actually done a virtual webinar that was paid for. So I taught myself everything in terms of creating a sales page, registration, the workflow of what emails would get triggered. And that happened all within a 48 hour period. I launched it on March 20th. And since then I've been doing workshops pretty much bi-weekly. Wow, amazing. Okay. So you recognize that there's an opportunity here to still continue to deliver uh, services and products to your, to your customer. You quickly figured out how to set it all up uh, technically what what uh, did it go smoothly? What went wrong? What are some things that you feel like uh, I guess you've improved in the subsequent uh, subsequent seminars? Yeah, the of course things always go wrong, and even with Zoom, there's there's technical issues. But for the most part, the virtual workshops have been insanely easier than doing an in person event and traveling to other places. Like the overhead alone, my profit margins on these virtual workshops are over 90% because my only expenses really are a Zoom moderator who I found on Instagram, whatever subscription fees I need for Zoom and my sales pages and everything else other than the PayPal fees and, and the transaction fees, that's cash in my pocket. So for the return on the effort that I'm putting out, it's, it makes so much financial sense for me as a business. Like now I'm going to look back at the pandemic and say, this was such an unprecedented time and it was so unexpected, but I just had my biggest sales month of the entire year. And I'm now able to reach business owners from around the world because with my in-person workshops, they were just limited to one particular city. So I did Maui, I did Palm Springs and I did Toronto So for that, that was still very limiting to me in terms of what I could, the kind of advice I could offer people. It's if you're attempting to sell or market your services or businesses during these times, you have to understand that as a business owner, we are the ones keeping the economy going because it's the small business owners, it's the local businesses, it's the makers and and the handmade local organic, whatever you want to call it we're the ones still stimulating the economy because all of our products and materials and services that we offer are with us. And that was what I told myself. I said, Kat, you are so equipped to do this. And so it's your responsibility to now show up for your community and say, Hey everyone, I can teach you how to sell online from the aspect of your content planning. Cause as we know right now, Being online is the only way you can reach your people. And so if you come at it from a space of, I want to help you, I want to serve you, and also offering them payment plans, because, I mean, we're all holding onto our purses a little bit tighter. If you can come at it from a space of service, as opposed to, I'm simply trying to pay my bills, or I'm trying to generate money in my business right now when things are so uncertain, then you're going to do a lot better. Because even the first workshop that was in March 20, that was on March 28th, when we were really, really in the thick of it, and it sold out really, really quickly because I came at it from a point where I said, if you attend the workshop, now more than ever is the time where you need to be online. And so I knew that what I was offering was of really, really great value to my community. What was the breakdown of how much of your business was in these in-person workshops versus the planners that you were selling? No. So that's a really great question because the in-person workshops are more intensive and they get fed and coffee and tea. Like there, it's such a different experience of my brand. So I knew that one, it was obviously a less concentrated version of the in-person. It was scaled down from a 
two, like a two day, six hour experience each. And even with the retreats, those are four days. So having it be this day experience condensed down into four hours, I knew that I couldn't charge the same price, which was, as I told you, like 500 to $800 US. So the current price for it is 134 for early bird and then 184 if you want to attend the workshop as a regular ticket. So the price is discounted, obviously, and I took into account, okay, what kind of value am I bringing to the table if I know that they're interested and if I can fill a workshop that has 100 people each time, then I'm making more than enough profit and I knew that I couldn't charge $500 and I knew that I couldn't necessarily charge the prices I was charging. And I came up with the price because I didn't want it to be too low that people wouldn't find value in it. But I knew that if I pushed past the $200 or $300 mark, I would be missing out on a lot of my customers. Got it. So I think you touched on something really important, which is which is the, the most common objection right now from consumers is that they're holding on to their cash, that they're not sure what's going to happen with the lockdown, how long it's going to last. They're not sure if there's going to be a longstanding recession. They're not sure if they should be spending cash right now. And you said something really important, which is that you kind of flipped it around and you told that told your customers, your, your ideal customers, your clients, that you cannot reach your customers in person, that we can't see each other in person. And the only way to reach out to them to reach them is through the kind of content that you create online, which is the same stuff that you teach in your workshops and then, of course, with your, with your content plan or product. Were there any other ways that you found to kind of address this objection that customers are fearful of spending money right now, that they don't think they should be spending right now, especially with with a higher price point that you're offering with your workshops? Yeah, I think, again, a really important question to address because at the end of the day, we're all business owners and we're charging a price for our product. And I think for me, from a content aspect and from a marketing aspect, I was so clear on the value that they would receive from investing in this training because I'm teaching you how to show up online so that you can sell whatever it is, whether it's products or services, and whether it's you transitioning your business to an online, maybe e-commerce store. So when it comes to that, there's, there's the whole mindset of it. So marketing it, more as an investment. Because again, like you said, we're going to be in this maybe until the end of the year. And I think a lot has changed in terms of the marketing world. So if you can offer value to your community, then you need to be very clear and straightforward about that as opposed to saying, okay, here's the price tag. This is how much you're going to pay. Instead of talking it from a price standpoint, you can say, this is how you're going to benefit. You're going to show up with your online content and be really confident you're going to create conversions because you're serving your community, et cetera, et cetera. And then from a technical aspect, I think it's important to understand and empathize that people work really hard for their money and you have to show up and create value and give them really high quality experiences, whether it's a product or a service. So If you're going to gift them something or if they buy your product and you ship them a little extra something or you include a free gift or you include a handwritten note, something that makes them feel special and and kind of celebrating the fact that they bought from you. I mean, you should be doing this regardless as an e-commerce business owner, but especially now adding that little special touch, recognizing them as a customer and then empathizing with the fact that they might not have the funds right now. So maybe it's offering a payment plan or maybe it's offering them a discount, which is a case by case basis. Like if someone comes to me and and they explain their story and they're like, Kat, I really want to attend the workshop. I'm like, this is great. Now I'm going to now offer it as an ongoing course. So I could offer it at a lower price point or potentially offer payment plan options. Awesome. So I think a lot of businesses out there might be considering either finding ways to take their, to create these online kind of workshops where they can teach things themselves as some kind of service based component that can be delivered online. For anyone out there that is thinking about following your path where it makes sense for their business to teach, to create some kind of workshop teaching things that they know, 
how would you begin? You know, regardless of you know being a pandemic or not, when people out there want to look at how can they sell more kind of these workshops online, how do you begin? How do you identify what you're what you should be teaching? Yeah, my go to for this is always community feedback. Let your customers and your followers, your email list, and all the people that follow you and and who are fans of you, let them simply tell you what they need, what they want to see from you, what kind of problems they're struggling with, what they want more information about. Because you could be launching your own product or a new training or a new online course and completely miss the mark when it comes to delivering to your community. So I always start with my community and I do it on Instagram because that's for me my most engaging platform. That's where I do a lot of my marketing and a lot of my content and training. And so I ask my community all the time, like, what are you struggling with? What are your pain points? What do you need more clarification on? What do you need to learn more about? And I actually record their answers in a Google doc and I aggregate, okay, is there a common theme here? Is there a struggle that they're all going through that I can solve? And then I build a product from that. Awesome. So I'm looking ahead over the next year or over this coming year as we are living in unprecedented times, do you have a plan on how you want to either adapt your business more or, or plans on how to, to, to survive or in your case thrive in this new environment? Yeah. So it has been a really great time for my business and I'm so blessed and grateful for the skills that I have in my community. And with these live workshops, I'm now working on offering them as an on-demand course and they'll be able to access there's four lessons in the workshop and I'm going to chop them up they can either purchase each lesson they can purchase all of the lessons together and watch it on their own time so that's the first phase of what I'm working on right now and then from that which I didn't even realize was an opportunity from these workshops especially looking through the chat and talking to all the attendees they now want a group coaching accountability program. So more time with me where we can sit in on a Zoom call and I can see their faces and it's more of a conversational type environment because with Zoom webinars, it's very much a one-way conversation. There's a chat on the right-hand side, but with those trainings, you're still the teacher and the students are there and they're listening. And in my workshop, we do a few hands-on activities But for the most part, I don't really see their faces. And from what the community has said and requested, again, listening to your community, is that they want further accountability from this. And so that's going to be phase two of this brand new offering for my business. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your experience, Kat. In this next update, I'm joined by Jimmy Finley Hickey from FinleyHats.com. Finley Hats sells hats that have useful and customizable laces and hidden pockets. In this update, you'll learn how they pivoted to making medical supplies for various medical groups. All right, Jimmy, so thank you for coming back on the podcast. So tell us a bit more about what your business is like and how it has been impacted since the the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Hey there, Felix. Definitely happy to be back uh, on your podcast. So... We've actually had like three different little sub stories with all this. One has been the uh, the positive with the Medical Shield project. One has been the kind of neutral to semi negative. Uh, we did a me- uh, what is that surgical mask project that ended up being a lot more than we expected. And then third has just been our general uh, sales and e commerce sales, which are surprisingly thriving through these crazy times. Mm-hmm. God. Okay, let's talk about the general business then, because that was already obviously in place before uh, you guys uh, pivoted or attempted two two pivots. It seems like so. What what is it that you you do typically sell for anyone has that has not heard your episode yet? And what were the results from once the pandemic hit? So we sell hats built for good times that are unlike anything else on the planet. Uh, we sell and make some of the best hats that exist. Um, so when the pandemic first started, we saw like a major drop in sales and our advertising was horrible and just traffic was down. And obviously people were kind of freaking out and panic buying toilet paper and not necessarily, you know, buying little luxuries like a hat. And we expected that trend to continue downward. So we actually uh, secured a loan through PayPal to kind of help float us through the next couple months in case we did see a major drop in sales or that trend continued. Uh, but to our surprise, uh, after the you know initial couple weeks of down sales, the 
market completely changed for us and we started seeing like unprecedented uh, sales through our website. Uh, we do mostly e-commerce and it, we just started seeing a much higher daily volume of sales and we have seen pretty much all year and uh, all of 2019. So wow, <laughs> been, so, been surprised me trending up. Yeah, so let's dig into that. So first of all, the the loan through PayPal, you, it sounded like you secured that pretty quickly or at what point were you, I guess at what point during the, the I guess the timeline, just to kind of lay the timeline out, it looks like probably like beginning to mid-March was when the U.S. started to lock things down and people started seeing layoffs and the economy started to take a hit. At what point did you start saying, okay, we need to find some way to uh, strengthen our kind of financial you know, foothold? Uh, do you remember the day that the NBA was canceled? And that was kind of, it felt like the big wake-up call for sure, <laughs> nationwide. Yeah. Uh, I'd say within three or four days of that, uh, we secured the PayPal loan to keep us uh, afloat. At least a, mm. in theory. Mm-hmm. And was this um, specifically for businesses hit by the pandemic, or was this like a typical PayPal loan that they would just give out any any other time? It was the like the regular PayPal capital loan, uh, which we've done a handful of times in the past to help uh, invest in like some infrastructure for the the business. Um, is our yeah. third time through them, and it's a pretty simple process where they just take a portion of sales, uh, you know, through PayPal, which is like I think our third most used payment processor. So we don't really see the a major, you know, effect on that. But got it. Do you have to qualify anyway for anyone out there that is looking to to do something similar where they they they're they're seeing their their cash flow tied up and they need to have something to carry them over. Do you recommend going with PayPal credit? Yeah. The uh the PayPal uh, I think it's PayPal Capital and then they do have PayPal credit as well, which I think is a slightly different program. Um but we've used PayPal uh, capital in the past with no problems. Basically, they look at your daily uh, volume or maybe your monthly volume through your PayPal account, and then we'll just give you offers based on whatever you uh, are making through that account. Uh, it's very similar to the Shopify capital, except with PayPal, it's just taking a portion of every PayPal sale until you pay back. Like there's like a fee to use it, um, and it's generally like fairly competitive with banks. Maybe a little bit higher rate, but it's a lot easier than getting a loan through a, a bank or any traditional lender um not it's not for everyone but uh it's definitely you know helped us in the past and (laughs) secured our our future Mm -hmm. a little bit through this got it so when you you mentioned that once things started getting real in the u.s your business started taking a hit but things started turning around like how soon after i guess was that timeline like was it a couple weeks later like when did you start seeing things change and did you do anything like what what was being what was happening that you think led to the change so I'd say mid to late March, um, it kind of started to turn around. We started seeing like about a normal or level of, of orders through our website. And then uh, April is when it really started to pick up. I think that the biggest thing that was noticeable, like just a tangible, visible thing that we could see was that our Facebook advertising was simply uh, working at like an all time high, about as, as good as it ever has. Uh, and this is back to like 2017 or so uh, when we were seeing some explosive growth through Facebook advertising. Um it, 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 it basically less people competing out there, less businesses trying to get in front of people made it uh, your CPMs, your cost to reach people go significantly down. And our advertising uh, was just giving us a huge return that we just haven't seen in a long time. So we, uh, you know, really try to capitalize on that and keep scaling it. Got it. Now, did you change your messaging when it came to your, your marketing th- that you were doing through Facebook ads or, or did you keep it the same? Did you try to kind of like change, I guess, change the messaging to to keep updated with the times? Um, not on the advertising end. To be honest, our advertising is pretty, we have a handful of uh, working funnels and uh, strategies that we, we run daily. And we didn't make any major changes on the front facing ad end. the changes we did make are uh, on the engagement and views end, both on like an advertising end of just getting st- strictly engagement campaigns uh, and, and awareness campaigns, but also just on the general content that we were putting out for our community. We were very from the very beginning. And you can look at our, our post dates. We took a pretty strong stance on spreading positivity, being there for our, our community, being there for our team, having unlimited sick pay. We took a very like firm stance a little bit before other brands kind of jumped on the train of, of what they were doing to be proactive about the, the COVID-19 situation. Uh, so we were very vocal early on about how we were trying to be positive, how we were trying to contribute, how we were, we were trying to give back, not just to our team, but to our community and that side of things. So our messaging on the direct to consumer, like actual posts uh, was what really, really changed. Not necessarily our ads for sales, uh, which stayed pretty consistent to the day. 
uh, some more like kind of organic content was being changed. Now, did, did you find that the the types of sales you're getting, were they coming more from new customers or existing customers? Did that kind of mix change during this time? Um, both our, our existing customers are, are, you know, we have a lot of repeat customers. We're super lucky to have such a strong and engaged community called the Finley Force. And we have, we, we launch weekly hats, uh, like usually five to 10 each week that are limited edition anywhere from one of 10 to one of 60 to sometimes 100 plus. Um, but those usually sell out um, just in this through this period, we've been selling out within like an hour or two, a lot of days. Um, so we're getting a lot of repeat customers. But because the advertising is is so much more effective right now, we're actually bringing in like probably a, just a significant uh, increase in new customers every day, which is amazing and something that Years ago, when our advertising was working as well as it is today, we didn't take full advantage of. So kind of like I said earlier, we're really, really trying to dive in to our prospecting campaigns to bring these new people to our uh, our website and into our community. And uh, so we're seeing a major spike in new customers right now. And it's uh, it's a really beautiful thing. Got it. Okay. So the, the business it took a turn a turn around. It, it took a bit, but then all of a sudden it spiked again. It sounded like because it was so much so much cheaper for you to acquire customers. Seemed like a, a big reason for that. And I think that's important because I think a lot of people, a lot of businesses are thinking, man, I these times are tough. Let me cut advertising. Let me cut those kind of ex, quote unquote expenses. But you saw it as you recognize that it was an investment that was even better, better kind of returns than ever before. Now you mentioned that you also had, an, there's another story behind this, which was first you, the, or there's two stories. One is the, the, the positive, the, the positive side, which is the medical shield project you talked about and the surgical mask project. So which one of these did you pursue first? So, well, from the very beginning, we uh, I remember reading on Reddit that there were uh, people that were currently being kept alive on ventilators that had 3D printed parts. So super early on, we have a 3D printer, we have laser cutters, uh, we have a sewing team. Like we started looking into ways to give back. So from the very like early stages of that, we started looking at making respirators. We started looking at uh, and and making sewn uh, face masks. And then slowly, as we kind of learn more and more about that, we learned that there was a shield opportunity that uh, medical shields, face shields needed to be made. Um, so this, it kind of, they flew, they, they, they were fluid. They came together kind of around the same time as we were learning more and more about what our capabilities were. Um, but it all started from that little respirator, 3D printed respirator project, and then slowly evolved into understanding where the limitations were. Uh, there's a lot more technical specs that go into like an actual filtration system respirator than into a, uh, um, a, a medical shield or even a sewn mask. And you you guys, and the way that you guys create your products, the, the manufacturing is, is all in-house? The majority of it. So we, as far as we, we start with a blank hat and then we do all the finishing decoration to it and the parts that make it a Findlay hat. So we had the lace or we had the uh, embroidery. We do leather patches. All of our hats have these stampede laces on the front of them, which I know I went into detail in our last podcast, but they're basically uh, laces that go on the brim of the hat that can be brought down around your chin and also worn as a, an accent. Uh, tied in different styles, different colors and whatnot. Uh, so we had those in house and then they also have a hidden pocket inside. So we sublimate that and attach the pockets as well. Um, so we do a lot of, I think it's like 12 to 15 steps per hat are done in house. And the only thing we're not doing right now that we're outsourcing is the actual build of the hat, uh, which mm -hmm. is done by our manufacturer. Got it. So now the, the, the surgical mask project, or at least the ventilators, which is where it started, um, and then also the, the medical shield project, that, those are all attempts at, at using your current manufacturing kind of um, capacity to create those, those, new, those new projects, those new, those new I guess, products? Exactly. And it's not, not just using our, um, you know, our infrastructure and machines to do that, but also like the sourcing and uh, just finding the stuff because there's a shortage worldwide, just spending time to, to find the right manufacturer or supplier of the plastic of the materials that we need for this was an amazingly <laughs> in-depth test of my uh, sourcing abilities. And I've been you know doing this for six years now. And it was uh, that, that alone was a big piece of it that I think was a pretty big bottleneck for other people. And is it just like pick up the phone and knock on the doors to try to find the right supplier? Or, or did you learn something about the techniques to to get to the right person for anyone else out there that is looking to find other ways to contribute now or in the future if you have to kind of on a short notice find the right supplier? Any any learnings from from this uh, experience? Honestly, nothing nothing short of like you said. There was a lot of lot of a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails. Uh, not not much door knocking because most of the suppliers are not local. We mm -hmm. luckily did find one local supplier uh, that was just south of Portland for two of the main components we needed. 
Um, but really, it was just a, a numbers game. It took it just took a lot of research and reaching out. And uh, luckily, there's a pretty you know because there is a very unified effort of people trying to do these medical projects. There is a pretty good source of uh, data for for people that are contributing. So luckily, I found the master list and just kind of started at the top with the people who had the largest supply and kind of went down from there. Got it. Now, so for anyone else out there that is already running a business and is now looking to find other ways to to to, to serve or to to create you know innovation around the situation that we're in, how did you find w- ways to manage the balance of running your business while essentially trying to start up another business at the same time, or at least <laughs> start up a new supply chain at the same time? What what was the key there? Well, early on, we we were when we started the medical project, we we pretty much told the team we were going to stop doing our hat production for the next couple of weeks and just focus on medical stuff. And while we were fulfilling old orders, uh, the balance wasn't really there. We just assumed orders would be down. We wouldn't need all hands on deck for hats so we could shift focus to the medical stuff. So there really wasn't much of a balance from the beginning uh, in that we didn't expect hat orders to come through. Mm. And uh, as the orders kept coming through and we couldn't really slow, we didn't want to slow that down. We were actually, we just had to hire on additional help to just do the shield projects. Now, I want to jump back real quick to the to the business, to the, to the hat business. Was it were people buying it because of like the changing use cases, like more people at home, no haircuts? Like, what was it that <laughs> that led to the increase in that? Besides, like the, the the cheaper cost of acquisition, like what was it about the use cases that changed? I mean, I think that would be a, a worthwhile thing to dive into. My assumption is, you know, our hats have a hand. People buy them for a handful of reasons. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't leaving the house, so there, it's less of a fashion statement if you can't really mm-hmm. go out and about. But I think it's it's something that people look to as like a comfort purchase. It's a little piece of you know the the norm. Uh, it's something that is an u- unique identifier. It's something that people can relate to. Um, you know, for all the reasons people consume, you know, brands. I think you know now more than ever, people want something that kind of. Uh, you know, they can feel uh, a part of something bigger. You know, our, with, we really push our community, the Finley Force, hard. Uh, we had a lot of people who just said, hey, I see all the, the projects you're doing. We're very vocal about the medical projects. Mm-hmm. I want to find a way to help you guys. I want to support you guys. Uh, and then even the, the more, you know, uh, surface level stuff, you know, oh, yeah, that's a really cool design. And I want it because it's a one of one or, or a one of 60 limited edition. Um, you know, and our, you know, some of our hats go up in values and people collect them. So there's, there's, I think a a magnitude of different reasons for why we've seen this. Um, I I think it would be interesting to really dive in a little bit further on that, but those are all First sure. When you up. when you have a little more breathing space, I'm sure you <laughs> can do that. Now, okay, so let's talk about the medical shield project. This is the most successful story that was was clear, clearly built up to 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 serve and to to help out with the community. Tell us more about that. Like, what was it? What exactly was the medical shield project? Like, what did you guys create, and and how were you able to get get into the hands of the people that need it? So I, I mentioned we started with respirators first, and we realized that was insanely tough to do. And in the process of that, we realized that shields were just so, so much easier. So we shifted all of our focus to just making the shields. There's about a thousand different ways to make a little plastic piece to cover your full face. And we experimented with probably 888 of them. Uh, we had our our laser tech, Oliver, and 3D uh, like our mad scientist, just running different samples and styles and really configuring all these different styles to figure out what would print the fastest, what would be the easiest to make, what would be the most cost effective um, and that side of things. And we just, we prototyped a lot of different styles. And we finally landed on a couple that we found online that were open source that we were able to uh, kind of make our own and modify to be even a little bit better. Um so we made a bunch of different styles. We found some that were, worked best for us. And we actually posted on Instagram, uh, hey, this is what we're working on. Just a heads up, we're going to slow down hat production and work on medical shields. Here's what we have. And amazing enough, we had probably five to 10 people that were representatives of, uh, or at least it worked in the medical uh, uh, world, reach out to us for samples. Um, so that was one one outlet, just a simple Instagram post. Two, uh, we have family and friends that work in the uh, like again in the medical world, and through them we have, they have connections, and we were able to get connected with uh, a hospital in Tacoma, a medical group that's local and in Seattle, and um, so through family and friends we were able to get connected uh, and social media, and then just downright uh, just outreach. Um, you know, we emailed uh, like just general uh, supply chain like directors through, through places, um, which are just, you know, available on, on the websites. 
And uh, the first thing we did was we secure not first. The first order we got was just a small 30 piece order of shields for that small Tacoma or Tacoma based hospital. Um, we printed them using a 3D printer and submitted them. Everything went smooth. And then a couple days later, uh, we had we sent samples to another local medical group and uh, they got them and they said, OK, these are great. But what about this style? And they sent us a picture of another style. And Felix, it, it blew my mind. This other style that they sent us was just so off our radar, but it was a thousand times easier than the ones we've been making. It didn't require 3D printing. It just required the face shield component, the, the plastic part that covers the face, a piece of foam and elastic stapled to it. So simple takes, you can make, you can make like five a minute almost. And, uh, maybe wow. three a minute. I don't want to, I don't yeah, want to yeah. exaggerate too hard, but you can make, you can make them pretty quick. And, yeah, uh, yeah. with 3d printing, you know, we could make one every 45 minutes with a 3d printer, uh, mm -hmm. with the laser cutter, it was tough to find ones that were, would be strong enough to actually withhold like heavy use. So finding something that we could bulk produce this easily was insane. And within 30 minutes of getting the sample, I made a trip down to Lowe's. Uh, we made our own physical sample, submitted it to them. They picked it up, said, OK, can you make more of these? We said yes. And the next day we had an order for 15,000 of them. Wow, that's that's amazing. Now, is there, are there any like legal like logistics to involved here when they when you're producing, you know, basically medical equipment for for hospitals? Um. To be fair, there, there could be stuff that's on another level that we haven't encountered. Uh, so far, the logistics and supply chain teams have, you know, they've sent over their vendor compliance guidelines. It's a pretty simple process uh, because what we're like, the, the product of a, a shield is a pretty basic, you know, straightforward object. Uh, they have a standardized like requirements for them, and that's more or less it. Uh, so there's there's really no major hoops to jump through on that end of things. And because the supplies were so short and, and desperate uh, to whatever degree that that is, uh, they, there might have been red red tape that was avoided um, prior to contacting us. Um, I know, like talking to the supply supply chain people, they said that there was red tape to get to the point where they can request this style um, of shield. Uh, but it had already been approved and already tested. So long as we could provide that exact style, which is, uh, you know, the three pieces total, uh, we could, you know, it works. Awesome. Now, when you think ahead about who knows how long we'll be in the situation, if there's a, a long lasting recession, how are you guys planning? Or what's your plan, I guess, to 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 be ready for this thing to last you know, longer than we might expect? So. You know, one thing from the very beginning, we didn't want to roll over and die. Uh, we would have done whatever we can to stay in business. That's why we got the loan. That's why when we saw sales were continuing to trend up, we've added fuel to the fire. We've added on three new employees just to help with production. Uh, we're trying to take full advantage of this while we can and just try to secure our cash reserves uh, in case, you know, a large recession comes and the glory days of <laughs> Facebook ads disappear again. Um, so, I mean, we're doing everything we can to take full advantage of it where we can, uh, from a financial standpoint, uh, we're doing everything we can to give back to our communities. So not only do, you know, we're doing these large orders, we're still donating to free clinics. We're donating to EMTs. We're donating to pretty much anyone that can't afford a shield that wants when we're sending them to individuals. Uh, so we're trying to do our part to give back, but we're also trying to do our part to stay in motion and keep the ship afloat through the potential, you know, murky waters ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your experience, Jimmy. Heck yeah, Felix. Happy to share and uh, good luck to everyone out there listening. In the final update for this episode, I'm joined by Patrick Cadu from Supply. Supply is an independent online retailer of premium grooming gear for guys that demand the best. In this update, you'll learn how they turn around from a 60% plus drop in daily sales. So, Patrick, can you describe your business and, and what, you're, what you're, you, you sell you know, before the pandemic happened and, of course, now? Yep. So my company is called Supply. Uh, our website is supply.co. We sell premium high-end men's shaving products. Our flagship product is a stainless steel single blade razor. And the reasons our customers buy it is it gives a close and comfortable shave, but without the irritation and ingrown hairs that multi-blade razors cause for a lot of guys. Got it. So what was your immediate reaction after the pandemic, COVID-19, and the lockdown started happening? You know, set the stage. I think we all kind of remember around mid-May. For us, it was, uh, excuse me, not mid-May, mid-March. For us, it was mm -hmm. around kind of March 16th. Um, our our sales basically went off a cliff um, when things kind of, when, when everybody woke up and realized that things were getting bad. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So we spent uh, a good three, four, maybe five-ish days trying to get our heads on straight and figure out what what exactly we were dealing with. Um, and you know, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster since then, but we've, we, uh, we went through a few bad ideas to about how to respond and finally got to a good idea and, um, have, uh, seen a lot of success since then. Got it. Okay. So talk to us about that. Like, so what, what, what do you say fell off a cliff? We're talking about like a 50% drop, like how drastic of, of a drop were you seeing? Yeah, I think uh, at the time, it's hard for me to remember, it's been two months now, but at the time we were seeing at least a 50% drop in daily sales. It, it may have been more like 60 to 70. Wow. Um, you know, we were losing organic sales, we're, we're out the window, and then, um, you know, our, our advertising just wasn't working anymore. So, you know, when that's not working, um, you know, we just stopped spending. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, things, sling, things slow down pretty considerably uh, when, when everything hit the fan. Got it. Okay, so you said that you went through a couple iterations of ideas, some not so great, and then some that did finally work out. So talk to us through that kind of iteration, that ideation phase. Like, what were you guys trying? What was the goal of going through these ideas? Yeah, so it took it took me personally about, gosh, it took me probably longer than I'd like to admit, probably three or four, maybe five days to to really understand mm-hmm. the the depth of what what the impact of what was coming at us. Um, you know, at first we were like, ah, maybe it's just a couple bad days. And then, you know, after a while we realized something something was going on and we needed to respond accordingly. So um, being a brand, and, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners have seen like just, uh, I've personally been inundated with like sale promotions and like it's almost desperate tactics from brands of, you know, that you can tell they're kind of hurting and, um, you know, 30% off, 50% off. And we didn't, we didn't want to go there. Um, you know, just start offering discounts to entice people. We've never been that brand. We never will be that brand. Um, so we spent a lot of time trying to, um, brainstorm, not only how will we respond as a brand through communication, but also, you know, what, what's going to be our kind of, uh, pricing and or promotion strategies to, to, um, to kind of face what, what we're going through. Because my hypothesis at the time was buying behaviors are going to be very, very different now than they were two weeks ago. So how do we present an offer that actually speaks to people in this circumstance, right? Because at the time people were spending all kinds of money on toilet paper and, you know, Lysol and wipes. So people, it's not like people were closing their wallets. They were just operating in different ways. So there's an opportunity for everything and there's a message for every situation. And and so anyways, we, um, we tested (laughs) my first idea, which I thought was super clever at the time in retrospect, I hate it, but, uh, we tested this one promotion where at the time that the stock market was really turbulent. Um, you know, we were seeing what, like 20% increases some days and 20% Mm -hmm. decreases other days. So I tested a promotion that was the short of it was we would essentially offer a discount to customers based on the, um, the, the amount that the stock market was down compared to the previous high. I kind of, I kind of see why that's clever. It's kind of catchy, catchy uh, headline. Yeah, we called it Market Watch March. You know, it was like you never know what the next day's uh, discount's going to be. So you might you might lock in today's because tomorrow might be worse or it might be better. Or so we thought it was kind of clever, and uh, we tried it for a little while, and the response was very not impressive. And you know, we sat on it for three or four days. It just didn't feel good as a brand because at one point we were offering like a thirty percent discount, which we we had never done in the history of the company. So we threw that, threw that out the window after maybe four or five days. And then um, we launched a second promotion, which um, we felt spoke a lot better to the, to the uh, time and the circumstance. And we offered, uh, if you bought our razor, which is $75, um, you'll get a free one-year supply of blades. And um, you, you can obviously off the bat see why that would be um, such an enticing offer kind of in the moment, right? Because people were, were hoarding hoarding products. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, that took off on day one and it didn't stop until we had to turn it off because we ran out of blades to sell. Um, so that really, um, that promotion in and of itself took us from, like I said, March 16th was a kind of yearly low. Like the that date was the lowest day of sales we had had all year to I think maybe Two ish weeks later, we had we we did a weekend that was bigger than 
it was um, our biggest weekend since Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So um, a complete turnaround. And uh, we just kind of rode that wave as long as we could. That's amazing. So definitely want to get into the details of how you ran the promotion in a second. But I think one of the important thing was here was that you tested different things out and it sounded like you went through these cycles of testing pretty quickly. So tell us about that. Like, what is your process? Because like this, again, this came out, came out, you know, to some degree out of nowhere for a lot of businesses. And you seem to immediately get into, let's try testing on different things to see what works. I think a lot of times when businesses see this, they just think about not trying new things, but let's just try to hold on to what is already working and then just cut our expenses. But you started saying, let's try to figure out how to present a new messaging, new offer out there. But like, what is your process for testing new things out? Like, what is it? Like, if you have an idea in your mind, like how do you, how do, how, how do you guys roll out a, a new idea that you want to test? Sure. I mean, it's pretty simple when you're as small as we are. We've got five employees and a couple of external agencies that we rely on. Um, so we can move pretty fast. Um, I think, I mean, the context is, look, this is, this is a new world we're living in and, um, like the old rules don't apply. And so that's what I told the team immediately was, look, the old rules were, we don't really get, we don't really do these kind of fancy, cute promotions. You know, it's like you buy our stuff or you don't, you know, that's kind of how we've always been. And this kind of new world we're living in and let's all rules out the window, let's test everything. And but, you're, you know, the specifics and the mechanics of the test, um, I mean, it's pretty simple. We, we use Facebook ads to test any kind of hypotheses like these because you can get very clear, quick answers on whether people purchase. You know, within a day or two, you can get results. So um, as far as the mechanics of the test go, it's, it's fairly simple. You know, you set up the ads to run to either a landing page or a page where a pop-up triggers for us we would run pop-ups. So uh, the pop-up would trigger and say, hey, here's the promotion, sign up for the promotion. Um, they could enter their email address and get the get the promotion to where it automatically applies in the cart. Um, and then typically we like to run um, things like this uh, as automatic as possible. So, um, you know, we'll always use apps that allow um, the promotion to automatically apply in the cart or, or in the case of the free year supply of blades you know it there was a pop-up that said hey you got your free your supply of blades you know add this to your cart now so um i'm not sure if that answers the question but that's yeah. kind of some of the mechanics definitely so i think one important thing that you brought up which was that because your brand has never really presented itself as like promotions or discounts or things like that you it didn't it didn't seem to work but maybe maybe it wouldn't work in other circumstances you know beyond this anyway because this is not on brand and i think one important thing to think about here is that to attract customers that are maybe uh, not paying attention as much during these times or are tighter with the purse strings these times is to give them more value and a lot of ways we see this happening today that, that you mentioned which was to give them more value for their dollar by just charging them mm -hmm. less, giving them a discount. But you just flipped yeah. it on the other side and you said, let's give them more value by giving them more products for the same amount of money they're paying. So you're still giving them value, just that you're not discounting the value or discounting the kind of products that you're selling, which I think is important. Think about you're, you're achieving the same end result by giving them more value, but without the approach of discounting. Now, when you are taking this approach, did you have to change anything with like logistics or supply chain? I mean, a year's worth of a raise is that like you know a big disruption to to your your process your your shipping and fulfillment process? No, it's just a little bit on the back end. So we're actually with Shopify fulfillment network, so it, it's pretty seamless. We just all we had to do was create a new product that was a year supply of blades, mm -hmm. and I tell Shopify what what that product is, and it's essentially three extra packs of blades. And um, yeah, they it's it's really simple. They just box it up and ship it out. Um, so no issues there at all. Awesome. So you said that you had to eventually turn that promotion off because you guys ran out of blades. It did that well. What are you doing now? Then? What are you doing now? What's the plan? You know, moving ahead over the next year for how are you preparing for a kind of a long, you know, I guess a long uh, new normal for us. Yeah. So t to be clear, you know, it's we're still testing and making we're making this up as we go. Um, you know, it's it's not up and to the right constantly for us. So. Um, once we ran out of blades for that promotion, we started to 
it, it's actually interesting because it, it opened my eyes to how well that promotion did. And I thought, okay, there's something here. Let's try to test this in other ways. And so we ended up launching um, what is going to be a permanent membership program right mm-hmm. after that program, which is a mm-hmm. uh, essentially without getting too deep into the details. Uh, our membership program is if you buy our razor, you're automatically a member of the club and you will get a free shipments of our razor blades every quarter for the rest of your life, as long as you want them. Um, and there's some specifics about that. You got to pay for shipping if you're a basic member. And uh, if you're a pro member, which is 20 bucks a month, uh, we'll cover shipping for you, excuse me, 20 bucks a year. We'll cover shipping for you. But, uh, the point is, uh, as soon as we moved on from that previous promotion, we took those learnings and rolled it into this whole new membership program that is now kind of defining who we who we are as a brand uh, moving forward and we'll co- we'll continue to test new things we're rolling into memorial day and father's day and that's a h- huge time of year for us so um we're excited to to, to test that out but um without without droning on too long what, what i'll what i'll touch on real quick is what what you said which is we always 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 prefer to give more product than take money off when we're offering uh, more value to our customers. So we love, we love doing gift with purchase, you know, buy X, get Y or buy this bundle, you know, um, if separately it would be 200 bucks, but together it's 150. That sort of thing is, is the sort of thing that, that we love to do because we feel that's more in line with, with the brand that we're trying to build. Got it. And to close this out, the last question I have is like, so what was that learning? Was that learning? Because you mentioned how you are looking to, you recognize that there was this kind of buying, buying behavior of hoarding or just people wanting to know that there's a supply. There's, I guess, no pun intended, but there's a supply of things out there for them. Was that the learning? What was the learning that you learned about the new kind of buying behavior that might translate to other industries? Like what, what did you learn about the way people are buying today? Yeah, I think it was a combination of, you know, and it's 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 specific to us, but I'm sure there were other applications out there. But it was obviously the combination of hoarding, right? You know, people were buying your supply of toilet paper, you know, why not buy your supply of blades? But then at the same time, um, I, I have this personal hypothesis that I'm, I'm going to go to the grave with uh, testing until I'm proved wrong that... <laughs> people are tired of these monthly subscriptions, um, in, in a lot of ways. And so the more value you can offer people in, in bigger chunks, um, uh, that's kind of what I want to do. So we're going to do quarterly shipments moving forward. Um, you know, this, this was obviously a yearly shipment that people really jumped on, but, um, I feel like people have subscription fatigue when it's on a monthly basis. And, um, so I, I think the promotion really spoke to them in the fact that like it's one transaction. I get everything I need for a year. I don't have to think about it, worry about it, you know, get overshipped, get undershipped. It's like I, I got it all in my bathroom. And um, for us, the products are so small that they take up no room. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful to other merchants, but that's kind of my hypothesis and, and what we're going to continue to test moving forward. Awesome. Definitely looking forward to hear more about your results. And thank you so much for coming on, Patrick. I think that was super enlightening for everyone to understand more about how to come up with a new offer without, again, without discounting your, your brand or your products. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Felix. Appreciate you having me. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Shopify Masters, the e-commerce podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs powered by Shopify.